What's up YouTube? Paul Fadiko over here. I'm just chilling in the Chicago airport right now waiting for my flight. Today is going to be my first day ever traveling outside of the United States. Okay, I was in Canada for like a day when I was 12, but we're not counting. We're not counting Canada. We're not counting Canada as a country. Okay, so first we're flying into Qatar where I'm gonna have a 12 hour layover. And I believe it is pronounced Qatar. I mean, and I'm gonna say Qatar. It's technically Qatar, we're more Qatar, which is like really hard to pronounce for my American accent. I think Qatar sounds kind of vaguely evil, so I'm just gonna call it Qatar. Now Qatar is the wealthiest country in the world with a GDP per capita of $130,000. That means the average income of the entire country, if it were divided amongst the entire population evenly, accounting for purchasing parity, which means the differences in price in different countries. Every person in the country would make $130,000 a year. That's a ton of money. <laughs> Now, if you compare that to United States, the average GDP per capita income is about $57,500. Then after my layover in Qatar, I'm gonna be flying into Nepal, where I'm gonna be staying for two and a half weeks, living with the villagers, living with the locals, helping you rebuild some of their local infrastructure that was destroyed in, lo in a recent earthquake. You can tell we're in the international part of the Chicago airport because they keep rambling in the announcements in other languages. Now, Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world with a GDP per capita of only $2,300 a year. That means the average person in the country has to live on only $6.30 a day. That's it. So that got me to thinking, why are some countries rich and other countries poor? And answering that question is gonna be the topic of today's video log. But first I gotta board a 13 hour flight, which is leaving in like five minutes, so I, I gotta get out of here. Awesome. Jossum over here. <laughs> Paul, Haley, and then his wife, no, his, his brother is getting married to someone from my hometown, In somehow. Apple. Guess my age. Young, so I wanna say like, you're older than, at least give me this, you're older than me. Yeah, yeah, I'm older than you, I'm older than you. 25, 26? See, they always get that. I'm actually, I'm actually 33. I'm actually 33, what yeah. The She's only 21, she's a little baby. 33? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Get the fuck out, man. She always says that, I know. And then she's always like, Paul, you're getting old. You look old. <laughs> You look so old today. Listen, I have a friend who's like balding and like uh -huh. shaved his head completely bald and he's only 25. <laughs> and he looks like he's 45. Poor guy. So I mean, I mean. It's the hair, <laughs> the, the hair goes, it's bad. Listen, even if he didn't have the hair, <laughs> the guy would still look 45. <laughs> I don't even know. I can't believe you're 33. Dude. I know. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> My little goodie bag. A toothbrush, something kinky, earplugs. Walking off the plane now. That was a long 13 and a half hour flight. Okay, I'm in Qatar now, in the in Doha, in the airport. Say it got pretty sketchy when I was uh, pulling out my camera while trying to get through security checkpoints to get on the international flight and to get in here. So like, I just had to put it away, couldn't record any of those parts. But I'm here in the airport. We'll get some better B-roll than that. They have some really weird taste in artwork here. What is this thing? I'm assuming we'll get a copy. When I went through immigration into Qatar, they had like this, this I, they wouldn't let me take a picture of it, but they had this machine with like, like laser camera that was just like, went down and scanned my whole face. It was like some cool Star Wars like tech for immigration. Anyway, we're waiting for our shuttle and then we're gonna be exploring Qatar. This is what 150 bucks got. You got me 500. It's a one dollar bill. Pretty money. Like, the bills aren't even the same size. One's, one's bigger than the other one. Qatar has a population of about two million people, but only about 300,000 of those are actual citizens. So, the other 1.7 million are expats from other countries like Nepal or Thailand who are working here or just 
coming in to work here, and they have kind of like a stratified society going that protects the Qatari, Qatari citizens. Because if an expat who's living here wants to open a business, he needs to have a Qatari citizen as a sponsor who will own at least 51% of that company before he can legally open that business. So that kind of ensures that all the businesses operating in Qatar will be majority owned by Qatari citizens. Now, Qatari citizens, you get a bunch of other benefits. There's no taxes, free healthcare, free education. They actually do a really good job of education here. The, the latest king, he built an entire place called Education City. Much about it, but it sounds cool. The airport I'm in right now, it's only four years old, just built in 2014. We actually landed here in the middle of Ramadan, which is a Muslim holiday. So for an entire month, you have to fast from 3 a.m. to 6 p.m. You're not allowed to eat any food or drink any water at all. It's a Muslim custom so they can appreciate how people who lack those things feel. So then after 6 p.m., so the work days are shorter during Ramadan, and after 6 p.m. everything opens up again and everyone starts partying and eating a whole bunch. It's a bunch of festivity. Chilling here, waiting for a shuttle, which is gonna take us to a hotel where we can chill and then check out the whole city. So Qatar Airways hooked me up with this nice hotel room. My God, are you a video logger? Are you on YouTube? Do you have a channel? What's your name? I'm gonna subscribe and follow you. As all the kids at the airport, it was so cute. Leave a comment in the description down below if you think I should go for the seven to 12 age demographic. Change up this channel, make it a little more silly, a little more family friendly, age appropriate. I don't know. I'm open to pivoting the concept of my channel. Let's see if I can charge my camera batteries. Is that even, is that even an electrical outlet? Like, we're just gonna have to make do with whatever battery we have left on this camera. As soon as I landed in the airport, I wanted to go check out the city of Doha, get some cool shots, one of the cities, record some cool videos, but one, I was just so tired, and two, as soon as I walked outside, it was like, Poof being hit by like an oven. It felt like you were stepping into a sauna. It was so hot, it was so humid. It was 41 degrees Celsius, which is like 105 Fahrenheit. And my lens immediately fogged up. Like I couldn't even get any footage at all. Came to the nice complimentary hotel Qatar Airways hooked me up with. Took a nap, took a shower. Enjoy a post Ramadan buffet they had. Food here, it's all right. They really love their lamb. <laughs> and the city of Doha is really American friendly. Everyone here speaks English, although they have a really thick accent. So it's kind of hard to understand what they're saying. And all the signs in the city are written in Arabic and English, so you can tell what's going on. The city is set up to be very friendly to American tourists. But anyway, now that I get the chance to chill in private, I want to go over the main topic of this video log, which is why are some countries poor and some are wealthy? Cut back. Whenever I was walking around the airport with my camera out, some security guard would be like, Oh, you can't film here. No, no, you can't film here. It's like, what? The flight was about an hour longer than it otherwise could have been because we had to fly up past the North Pole because we had to go around Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, all of which are blockading Qatar right now because they're claiming Qatar is sponsoring terrorism or something or other like that. But whatever. It's a beautiful country and I'm having a good time. Okay, back to the main topic. I don't like calling countries poor. I'd rather call them stagnant because that's really what's going on. You have the wealthy countries that just keep growing at 3% a year or more, just getting exponentially more wealthy. Then you have the poorest countries on the bottom of the list and they have virtually no growth whatsoever. They're just stagnant. The rest of the world has developed and is growing but they're just stuck in the Stone Age and they can't seem to find their way out of it. Why is that? Because their laborers are not very productive and they're not very productive because they lack the capital that other more developed countries have. Now, there's three types of capital. The first is physical capital, which is farm equipment, roads to drive on, factories, tools, robots, airports. It's all the stuff that you wanna have as a tool to make more stuff. So if a farmer doesn't have a tractor, he's gotta use a horse or he's gotta plow his field by hand. So a tractor is a physical capital good that he can use to make himself more productive. The second type of capital is human capital, up in your head, your education, your training, your experience. Knowledgeable, experienced, competent workforce to produce cool things that people actually want to consume. Also the technological knowledge and know-how that's been developed over centuries by scientists and mathematicians. Third piece is organizational capital, like businesses. They take the human capital and the physical capital and they combine them together to make, to produce things that people want to consume. Think about all the big businesses in the United States like Apple, Google, Walmart, 
Walmart, they hire people, they buy things, and they use it to provide a service to consumers. Organizational capital also includes banks, markets, where you can borrow money and invest it in order to grow your business and productive capacity. So why aren't these stagnant countries able to grow their basic capital and then start using it to produce things? That's because they have corrupt or unstable institutions. Free markets are the most efficient way to allocate capital. So instead of the stuff that people produce being allocated efficiently by the free market, it's captured by corrupt governments who keep the money for themselves rather than reinvesting it in infrastructure, education, to make their people better off. Instead, these corrupt governments will take the money and siphon it off into offshore accounts to grow their own personal wealth and their own personal dynasty. But corruption isn't just in government, it's in business too. A business leader in one of these stagnant countries, instead of hiring workers based on merit, they hire them based on who they know, who they're related to. That means the best people aren't getting the jobs, instead their friends and family are getting the jobs. You can also have government, private corruption collaborating where the government gives certain private companies in these countries monopolies where they can exploit the people for whatever they want. Geography is another big factor. So countries located in tropical regions have a harder time farming because of the heat. Your country might also be landlocked, like if you don't have a major harbor where you can do trade with other countries, that's definitely going to hurt that country. There might also be cultural factors like a religion that discourages wealth creation. Now Qatar itself is really wealthy because of all the oil and natural gas that it exports. As so much money, the citizens here don't even need to pay taxes, they can get free education and free health care, which is a really nice bonus. But having an abundance of natural resources doesn't necessarily make a country wealthy. All natural resources do is serve as an intensifier that will make wealthy, fair countries even wealthier and more fair, but make poor, corrupt countries even more poor and more corrupt. So in a country like Qatar, which has good institutions, it's wealthy because they have an abundance of natural gas and oil which they can export to other countries, bringing a ton of money into the country. But instead of keeping it all for itself, the government uses that money to invest in human capital like education and physical capital like infrastructure. For example, one of the businesses they created was Qatar Airways, which is owned by the local government, the airline that I just flew in on, which will hopefully end up being a profitable business for the Qatar government. Whereas if Qatar had a more corrupt, unfair government, they would have just kept the money for themselves in some offshore account in order to make some king and his family super wealthy. I gotta get back to the airport if I wanna catch that flight. <sighs> Let's get out of here. We made it to the airport back again. Our shuttle driver scared the crap out of me. You know where you're supposed to give other drivers like space, you don't hit them? Yeah, he pissed that part of the class. But for some reason, those people's driving does not make me that nervous. I don't know how we survived getting here, honestly, like with how he was driving. Really? My drive makes you nervous, but not theirs? No, because I feel like they like. They know what they're doing and they're like professional. The okay, riddle me this. Why is there a giant. Is there a giant bear with a lamp on its head in the airport? I don't, I don't know. Qatar has the prettiest money ever. Look at this stuff. Sliding couple? Yeah, our first. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really good. We got Fatih over here. He's from Paris, France, and he has his own his own restaurant. Yeah, he has a restaurant in Paris, France. Three, three pizza, three pizza shops, right? Three pizza shops. There we go. I work for Italian speciality. Put a pizza shop here. You got to get a sponsor, a Qatarian sponsor. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to stay just to Paris. Yeah. Overall, I'd say Qatar is surprisingly like Western and Americanized and modern. Like, if you're from America, you're gonna feel right at home here. It feels more like New York City than anything. The next video I'll be recording will be in Nepal, so go to go ahead and click subscribe if you want to see that. I got a four-hour flight ahead of me. That's it. Man, it's nothing compared to a 13-hour flight. Believe that I left on a Sunday and I'm not arriving till a Tuesday morning. That's how long it takes. Plus, I lost you know 12 hours due to the due to the time zone differences. <laughs> All right, I'll be seeing you guys again real soon. Peace.